actually one announcement. And thanks again for coming out. I think you'll uh, be inspired by what is presented here and what is uh, happening in Nigeria, which is just a portion of the West and Central African uh, district work. But we thank God for what he's doing there. The African choir will practice 15 minutes after closing here in preparation for Wednesday morning teaching. And I was told where, but I don't remember. In the West Chapel, across the street, 15 minutes following this program. And um, I understand you know who you are. So we look forward to hearing you Wednesday morning as well. And after the conclusion of this 41-minute uh, uh, presentation, Brother Tony will sing a song that was sung at most of the dedications, Bless This House. So as he sings this song, that song is a prayer by all of us as he sings it to bless whatever house we worship in. And before we now proceed, let's bow our heads. Now let's stand, shall we? We'll have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to assemble again tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the work of God all over the world. Whether there be many or whether they be few, we know that you have promised to be in the midst of us wherever we worship you. We just thank you, Lord, that you will leave us encouraged and inspired in the Lord tonight to know that souls are still hungry for the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless this presentation and each one in our company. In Jesus' name, amen. There are faces before me, faces that I have seen before and many more that I have never seen, like those who wrote the letters that were read to you this morning. Hungry hearts, people that want a way out of sin and trouble, those who are groping for the way of life everlasting, those who have found it but want to know it more perfectly. And I pledge from the bottom of my heart to do my best to bring them the words of everlasting life and truth. That was George Hughes preaching in Portland shortly before his second missionary trip to Africa. The apostolic faith work on that continent began with a faithful few like Brother George who felt a burden for those in need of the gospel and answered the call. Missionary Frank Hine was one of those faithful. During the 1920s, he received apostolic faith tracts while in Africa. He visited Portland to learn more about the people who produced those tracts and decided to stay. He soon became part of the headquarters staff as a translator and printer. With his help, thousands of Africans received gospel literature in their own language. One of those tracts fell into the hands of Peter Vanderpoy of Ghana. Seeing the need of his people, he attended the Portland camp meeting in 1948 and issued a plea for someone to bring the latter rain gospel to Africa. Brother George answered the call, writing in his journal, July 3rd, 1948, volunteered for service in Africa or anywhere in the world. He arrived in Ghana that October and was met by Brother Peter and his congregation. After nine weeks in Ghana, he and Brother Peter received a visit from Timothy Oshokoya of Lagos with another call of invitation, come to Nigeria. Brother Timothy was a correspondent who had been led to receive his deeper experiences through some apostolic faith tracts he acquired in 1942. He had already prayed through the salvation after spending some time in jail. He described his conversion this way. Alone in the solitary cell, I heard as it were a panorama of my past life and a heavy remorse came into my heart. I reflected that I should have completed 
the Baptist Theological Seminary course and become the pastor of a church if my father's plans had been allowed to materialize. Then God spoke to me that it was pride that had brought me thus far. I admitted and started to plead for forgiveness. I entered into a covenant with God that if in his mercy he would set me free without being imprisoned, I would give the honor and glory to him alone. I would also serve him faithfully the rest of my life. I promised God I would not engage in the legal business again, but I would live to tell of his love and mercy. Early in 1938, I was discharged and acquitted by the court. Shortly thereafter, whilst praying one day, I had a wonderful experience which flooded my heart with joy that knew no bounds. I felt a great change in me and all about me. I knew I had one special blessing from God. I felt the presence of God with me every time and everywhere. I lost the taste for anything flamboyant. The experience put so much thirst in me that it prompted me to desire more of God and prayer. In December 1948, the three men set out to evangelize southern Nigeria. In 1952, they made a second missionary trip. Sixty-five years later, we see the fruit of their labor. In recent years, dozens of church building projects have been completed and dedicated in Nigeria. They will accommodate many thousands of saints. This past January, Debbie and I visited Nigeria for the dedications of six such locations. One of the dedications was in Lagos, where George Hughes, Peter Vanderpoy, and Timothy Oshokoya started their tour. The apostolic faith work in this city began in 1944 with a handful of people holding meetings in Brother Timothy's home. By 1948, during their first mission tour, Brother Timothy stood before a congregation of 85 as Brother George ordained him to be the Lagos pastor. He would later become the first Africa overseer with Lagos as the headquarters. The work continued to grow. On his second missionary tour, Brother George wrote this about the congregation. Here in Lagos, the people have the same zeal and enthusiasm common to our people, the same love to hear the truth and see it preached in all its purity and power, the same desire to spread the gospel, the same purpose to spend and be spent for God. How hungry these people are for the word of God. They pray most earnestly prior to the services, sing heartily, listen attentively, and then pour out their souls to God in the altar services that follow. The congregational singing is grand. When they sing in English, they do well. But when they sing in their own Yoruba tongue, it is out of this world. The testimonies are thrilling. Most were translated for me, but there is a ring of victory in all of them that one could not mistake even if he could not understand a word that was being spoken. Today there are 40 apostolic faith churches in the Lagos metropolitan area. This new Edomu church is one of them. This particular congregation began in 1989 when 15 members who attended Sunday services in Anthony Village started meeting in Edomu for prayer and Bible study. From that small group has emerged 12 Bible study centers, three branch churches, and a Sunday school station. In 1996, what is now used as a children's hall was dedicated. Then, in 2005, 
the foundation of the current church building was laid. It has been beautifully completed. The dedication began with a ribbon cutting ceremony, followed by a procession into the new church. Sunday school children dramatized the scene of an elderly and feeble King David giving his son Solomon a set of building plans and the charge to build a temple. They also depicted the Ark of God being taken into the finished temple and the fire descending on it as God's glory filled his house. After the message, Isaac Adigan, who joined us from the UK on this trip, prayed the dedicatory prayer. The remainder of the service was blessed by several selections provided by the choir and orchestra. During their first tour of Nigeria, Brother George, Brother Timothy, and Brother Peter visited the city of Ekotunwang. They had been warned it was a dangerous area. However, after having spent time there, Brother George wrote, The light shines brightest where the darkness is deepest, and there we found some of the most spiritual of all in Africa. Brother George described that first visit in his journal. As we drove up, a prayer meeting had just been dismissed. They all filed back into the church with much rejoicing to hold another service with us. Before the service was begun, they all went to their knees and a volume of prayer went up that would rival the opening altar service of camp meeting for earnestness and sweetness. How they sang, how they rejoiced. I can still see the smiling faces of the scores who were there that afternoon. They brought their questions for our answers. They had seen a great portion of their congregation go away because of the firm stand they took in the matter of adultery and fornication. The remaining few mourned the loss of so many, but still held fast to the hope that help would come from Portland to show them if they were right. When the service was finished, we drove away. The leaders were conspicuously absent. A dream they had prayed and fasted about for years was fulfilled, and then we could only stay 90 minutes. Their disappointment and grief was such that they could not face the parting. They left a Koten Wang in the hands of a very capable leader, Philip and Yang. However, they did not know if he was born again. They decided the only thing to do was to instruct him by mail. Later, Brother Timothy attended the Portland camp meeting, and upon his return to Lagos, he invited leaders to come hear his report. At Lagos, Brother Philip saw his need and humbled himself to be sure he was on the solid foundation. The Lord wonderfully saved him, then sanctified him, and soon baptized him with the Holy Ghost. When he returned to Ekotenwang, he told the people what he had learned and how he had received the grace of God. For a while he stood alone. Many were offended when he began to teach the word. Soon, though, a young woman prayed through and others saw the change in her. Then another and another prayed through, and a real revival began. In the months following, 47 received all three experiences. When Brother George returned on his missionary trip four years later, Brother Philip joined with Brother Peter and Brother Timothy to evangelize Nigeria. Brother George wrote of their arrival in Koden Wang. About 300 people were present to greet us. They had waited all day. As we drove in, they all started to run to us. They formed a long line of cheering, waving people. 
The din of their enthusiasm was indescribable. They praised the Lord and cheered and laughed all at the same time. At last the day had come. The promised return was an actuality. There was no instrument in the church, so all hymns were started by the song leader, who had a very good ability for arriving somewhere near the right key. Hymn books are practically non-existent, so the song leader read each hymn at the beginning and then shouted the opening lines of each verse in that tiny interval between verses. An enthusiasm and a real spirit of worship was present in the singing. The choir had prepared songs both in English and epic. While I delighted to hear their effort to sing in a language they did not know, I rose to new heights of enjoyment when they sang in their own native tongue. When the invitation was given, they just flocked to the altar until there was no more room. That same enthusiasm is still present today. As we approached the church, we were amazed at the sight of the assembled crowd, including 600 choir and orchestra members. After a ribbon cutting ceremony, they marched into the building playing and singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, with the ministers following. Then the congregation quickly filed in and found places to sit, all 19,800 of them. In addition, hundreds were left outside looking in. Brother Dillon is the current pastor at Ekotenwang and regional overseer of that district. Brother Muiwa, who served for many years as pastor at Ekotenwang, now pastors Abuja and has oversight of that district. The Sunday School children presented a program titled The Building and the Dedication of the Temple. It included a choir number, memory work, and a lot of drama. The adult portion of the dedication service was highlighted by music from the choir and orchestra. Before the message, a solo was sung by the daughter of the late Paul Ibikuno, who was the Cross River District Overseer in the 80s. Her mother, Esther, is with us at Portland Camp Meeting this year. After the dedication message, Brother Bio 
the West and Central Africa District Superintendent gave the dedication prayer, which was accompanied by the strong presence of God. Who are sick in their body, those who are here, who have just managed to go. And I said, if I can just manage to get to that, God will be able to. An invitation to prayer followed, with many thousands dropping to their knees in response. It was a great day in the Lord. Our church, just a two-hour drive from Akotenwang, was also dedicated on this trip. Brother George said this about its beginning. A young man by the name of Jonathan Bassey had received apostolic faith papers and saw the truth. When he was advised of the time of my arrival, he made a great effort to come from Calabar to Ekot and Wang. He came a hungry soul and God filled him. He received all three experiences in the meetings. Brother Jonathan had returned to Calabar with good tidings. When we landed, we were welcomed by a huge group of people who had come to the dock to greet us. They lined the streets for about a block. They crowded around the bus and cheered, shouted, and waved their hands in greeting as we drove through. At that time, the group in Calabar was at a point of division. They had been practicing a form of spiritualism that was at times fanatical, and they lacked real salvation. When Brother Jonathan found the truth, he wanted to see it take hold in his congregation, but the leaders perceived him as a threat. Brother George wrote this about the service they held. The church was nearby and was quite a nice mud and thatch building. The authority of the church was held by an elderly man they called their apostle. Brother Jonathan held a responsible position in the church and conducted the meetings, even preaching at times. With his help, we took over and turned it into a regular apostolic faith service. The meeting was opened by Peter, then Timothy, then Philip. Does it seem like I am traveling with the apostles? The testimonies of these men were of great value to the meeting. I preached from Malachi 3.1. Then the apostles said they wanted to do things in their usual manner. The four of us were about ready to leave the service when they started their fanatical manifestations. But Jonathan, without asking approval, called everyone to prayer. When we saw the heroic stand that Jonathan took, we all wanted to stay and fight the battle through to the finish with him. We four sprang to the altar rail and the congregation responded in the whole. Several hundred people went to their knees. The sight I then saw was enough to make one feel that the entire trip to Africa was paid for. Scores of people with hands upraised pleading for help from God, in addition to those who knelt praying in other ways at every conceivable place one could find. A young woman in front of me wept and cried and pled with Jesus. She was gloriously saved. It was a thrilling sight indeed. It will never fade from my mind. I asked Jonathan what they were praying for after a while, and he said that almost universally, they were asking God to forgive their sins and make them real Christians. 
When Debbie and I arrived in Calavar, Brother Bio wanted to take us immediately to see the church at night. We would soon know why. The location is one of the more densely populated areas of Nigeria. About 20 blocks before we arrived, we could already see the five-story tall church standing as a literal beacon of light in a community of mostly one- and two-story homes. The dedication service was the following morning. When Brother George preached the Bible truths without compromise years ago, he feared that there would be fewer apostolic faith churches in Nigeria than before he began his trip. But the 3,500 who were present on this dedication day is evidence of some who embrace the truth and pass it on to others. The local king and lieutenant governor were among those present. The orchestra members led the way into the building, marching while playing the battle hymn of the Republic. The program began with a children's presentation. 250 of them marched in time as they entered. Their presentation included a welcome song and a play, with lots of singing and recitation. The adult choir and orchestra took over, presenting a number of selections. A highlight was when the pastor who is also the Cross River District Overseer, brought the scripture reading. Eighteen months earlier, a ladder collapsed under Brother Jonathan, sending him three stories below to a concrete floor. He was flown to the capital of Nigeria, where his bones were reconstructed. He had not been expected to live. This day, he walked to the pulpit without a cane to the roar of appreciation from his loving congregation. We were happy to meet his wife and two sons afterward. The service closed with the choir singing the Hallelujah Chorus. Another dedication was held at Abiyakuta. Brother George and Brother Timothy stopped here in 1949 to meet with correspondents but were unable to locate anyone. 
1954, Brother Timothy returned with a team of workers and began holding revival meetings. For a month, they traveled to and from Lagos each evening to distribute gospel literature and conduct street meetings followed by evangelistic services. As a result, one local church embraced the teachings of the Lateran Gospel and transferred the leadership and legal ownership of their organization and property to the apostolic faith. In addition, many souls were saved. That church became the regional headquarters of this work. In time, it was relocated. We attended the dedication of this new Abiyakuta headquarters church and secondary school. As with previous dedications, this one began with a ribbon cutting ceremony, followed by a processional into the tabernacle. The children presented a drama on the beginning of the work here. They acted out the traveling Lagos missionaries presenting the gospel and the subsequent acceptance of signed documents giving authority to the apostolic faith. The dedication service was attended by over 4,000. It was blessed by choir, orchestra, and vocal ensembles, as well as a solo. The pastor led the congregation in singing, The God of Abram Praise. In attendance was Brother Ina who was pastor of this congregation from 1982 to 1998. He is now the Abaddon Regional Overseer. An additional ribbon cutting ceremony was held for the secondary school, which is next door to the church. The motto for the school is let the light shine. That won't be difficult in that the two buildings, which are very impressive structures, stand on the top of a hill overlooking much of Ibiokuta and therefore can be seen from miles around. Our team next drove to Otto Ikati for their dedication service. Brother Timothy brought the latter rain gospel here early in the 1950s when he visited on an evangelistic mission. Our work in Otto Ikati started with a few people meeting in the home of Brother Pelu. In 1967, they began traveling to nearby Akura to attend apostolic faith services. Their numbers soon grew, and Brother Pelu was asked to lead the group in Otto Ikati. In 1970, they moved into their first church building, a cocoa store. The group continued to grow, and in 1978, they relocated to a carpentry shop. In 1982, they purchased land for this building. Once more, there was a tremendous local turnout, this time numbering 3,500. After the ribbon cutting ceremony, we proceeded into the tabernacle as the brass played to God be the glory. The celebration began with a children's program that portrayed the dedication of Solomon's temple. The youngsters reenactment included everyone from workers in hard hats to priests and trumpeters who were present when the fire came down and consumed the sacrifices offered. They recited portions of the story and used songs to bring it to life. The choir sang some songs in their native tongue, as well as familiar pieces including Handel's and the Glory of the Lord and the Holy City.
The benediction prayer was given by the Addo Ikati Regional Overseer. As with all the dedications, at the closing, everyone was encouraged to go to their knees in prayer. At least 10 local kings were present who also knelt in earnest prayer to the King of Kings. final dedication was at the West and Central Africa headquarters at Anthony Village in Lagos. In 1953, shortly before leaving Lagos for the last time, Brother George wrote in his diary, Surely God has not only begun to work, but has been doing so in a real degree here in Africa. If he tarries a few more days, a much greater work will be done. Certainly that has been true. Today, our Lagos headquarters leads nearly 800 branch churches in 12 countries. A service was held in the Great Tabernacle before dedicating three specific areas of the Anthony Village Complex. A dormitory at the Apostolic Faith Secondary School, a resource development center, and the headquarters administrative offices. During the service, the students of the secondary school expressed appreciation for the academic and spiritual learning they gained by attending our school. Before the message, there were several selections from the adult musicians, including a ladies' quartet singing, Thank You, Jesus. Following the service, we moved to each of the three areas for a ribbon-cutting ceremony, a dedicatory prayer, and a tour. First was the New Boys Dormitory. This school was established as an academic and boarding system in 2002. Today, nearly 700 students live here. Previously during this trip, we had seen hundreds of these students wearing their school uniforms at a Sunday evening service in Lagos. At the altar call, they came forward and filled the altar area praying in earnest. It was easy to see that the school is an evangelistic effort from which the future church in this area could come. Next was the resource development complex which houses several pieces of new printing equipment in a block of new buildings. The idea of having a printing facility is the result of the hunger Brother Timothy had to spread the gospel to as many people as possible. He described the initial printing efforts this way. Right from the inception, we saw the need to get a sound doctrine of the word of God to our people. We already heard Sunday school books, which we are written in English, but in order to reach the bulk of the people among whom we work, we saw the need to publish the lessons in our own languages. We started with a speed print secondhand duplicator, 
given to us by the headquarters in Portland in 1951. Sunday school lesson outlines for adults, Bible text and memory verses, and leaflets for primary lessons for children were rolled out on the duplicator. The new dramatic changes in the printing area allow Hiraway Magazine to be printed in Nigeria. In the past, we have printed in Portland and then shipped 225,000 copies to them each quarter. Now they will be able to produce up to 1 million copies each quarter on site. On a continent where there is a hunger for gospel literature and 20 million souls in Lagos alone, it is easy to see that the demand will still exceed what can be produced. The new facility includes several printing machines, paper trimmers, stitching machines, a collation desk, digital lithography room, storage space for printed materials, director's office, and a modern training center. Finally, we dedicated the West and Central Africa Administrative Headquarters building, which houses offices for the directors of the many different aspects of the work. The headquarters office was moved to Anthony Village in 1984. Recently, it has undergone major renovation. In the boardroom, they requested that we pray for God's continued blessing on this great work in Nigeria. But there are voices calling. There are faces before me tonight. Hungry hearts. People that want a way out of sin and trouble. Those who are groping for the way of life everlasting. Those who have found it but want to know it more perfectly. And I pledge from the bottom of my heart to do my best to bring them the words of everlasting life and truth. Brother George Hughes saw faces before him and he answered God's call. May we likewise be inspired to continue sharing the gospel message with those whom God puts before us. Yeah. 
Please stand, we'll be dismissed in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your blessing upon this house and upon the houses of God where each one here worships when they go home. We pray that each of these places will be a place of refuge for each of us, the saint of God who can lay down their burdens and look heaven's way and know that the Lord will carry them. We pray that each one will be a house of salvation where souls who are laden down with sin can come and find deliverance. We pray, Lord, that families will be able to bring up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord in these houses. We pray, God, that uh, your blessing would go out from each house, wherever it is, that it will, each one, be a light to the neighborhood and to the community. We pray that you'll bless those who worship in these houses. We thank you, Lord, for the God of heaven who has changed our lives, brought us together from different parts around the world, and now sends us forth to go out and carry the gospel message. We thank you, Lord, for this high privilege and this responsibility. We need your help. We need your blessing. We're thankful we can petition heaven and ask for it and believe we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.